the opening itself is a 10,000 10, wow. so we have all-time high. 10,000 wow. mark has been taken out on the Nifty, and it is a historic day that uh, we are celebrating right at the NSC. The huge confidence on the political leadership, it's a confidence of Indian economy. Points to a long-term bull market uh, being in India in a very, very healthy manner. The number you're working with okay. 46 lakh crore rupees that's the total wealth in that's terms of market capitalization <laughs> big day or uh, congratulations to all concerned there's so much of wealth that has been generated i would say as far as india story is concerned i would repeat my uh, favorite phrase that picture abhi baki hai though. Well, 10,000 is here and the bulls defended it not once, not twice, but three times in the last three days. Hello and welcome to this special show, Taking Stock at 10,000. I'm Lata Venkatesh, with me Anuj. Anuj, you were there at NSC to celebrate this grand day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, I shouldn't be beginning with a but. This 500 points that the index put on in the month of uh, July, July had lots of support. It had Reliance, yeah. it had the metal stocks, it had bank stocks. My only worry is in the last week when the actual pole vault happened, mm. it happened only with private sector banks. HDFC twins, Yes Bank and maybe a little bit from Indusind mm. uh, and Kotak. Uh, so would you say that life after 10,000 is going to be tough? You know, I'll actually uh, maybe be on a different camp. Uh, if 99.50 to 10,000 surprise people, I think 10,000 to 10,500 could surprise people even more. Okay. Up. Uh, the market is going through what you call the PCS phase of a bull market. When that phase happens, in that case, you don't stand against it. Uh, you don't argue against it. And, you know, just like what happened on Friday, right? Uh, the market had a gap down for whatever reason, global queues, 99.50, and the market gave you 70-point intraday rally. I think what happened on Thursday and Friday for me, which I think is should be hammered home is the kind of delivery based buying that you had in names like yes bank hdfc hdfc bank also in bits yes. and pieces indusin bank uh, and also kotak mahindra bank i think the market flirted with icici bank and access bank for last three months but then it realized that maybe a committed relationship with uh, the likes of hdfc and yes bank is far it's better and off. more rewarding and is paying off and i think that's really the quality of the rally i think uh, is, is is interesting now you know you could argue about earnings but that argument has not worked for last six months or nine months uh, uh, this market actually could surprise on the upside because at ten thousand there's no selling if this market had to sell off, uh, Lata, it would have sold off by now. Uh, the fact that there's absolutely no sell-off. Today there was a bit of a scare, but the market moved on. And uh, I won't be surprised personally if uh, we have 10,500 sooner than later and, you know, count down to 11,000. Of course, at some point the market will correct, but sitting here right now with so many people expecting that correction, the market may not oblige. No, actually, yeah, markets are never static. If they don't sell off at 10,000, then they will climb. Yes. So uh, we must be prepared for that. And that's the pattern so far mm. that uh, the dips have been bought. And clearly, 9, 950 to 10,000 is emerging quite clearly as the new support. Uh, but uh, for the questions for the hereafter, we are uh, joined for a view from the top, as it were, by Manishi Ray Chaudhary of BNP Paribas. Manishi, uh, good to have you with us on what is a historic occasion. A lot of people believe this has been a kind of a hated bull market as valuations have become way over the top. Your thoughts? You know, I mean, India is, uh, in a sense, a macroeconomic sweet spot. You know, because while um, growth, at least by the official statistics, seems to be quite okay, um, the central bank in India, the Reserve Bank of India, is possibly the only one among the emerging markets which is also in a position to reduce interest rates at some point of time in the near future. You know, that's because inflation is benign, the currency is strong, so, uh, you know, there's obviously a possibility of such lower interest rates translating into lower capital charges for the companies and therefore giving a boost to corporate earnings at some point of time. So I think this hope of earnings revival combined with a much better policy environment that we are seeing in India, that has contributed to this rally. And on top of that, we are now seeing a deluge of liquidity, both from the foreigners and from the domestic institutional investors. In fact, I think for the first time over past 12 months or so, foreigners and domestic institutional investors are buying together. 
I mean, historically, as our data shows, they were uh, sort of neutralizing each other's flows. You know, so many of these uh, factors have actually coincided together for India, and that's why we're seeing such massive outperformance from this market. Now, having said that, valuation is indeed a, it's a valid concern because many other markets of Asia which have moved up sharply have been accompanied by earnings estimates upgrades as well, you know, which is possibly not the case for India. You know, so for this rally to sustain much beyond the current levels, we would actually need to see an on-the-ground earnings revival. You know, and I think you know, it would possibly come through by late 2018, maybe the second half of the fourth quarter. But in the interim, we have to keep our fingers crossed. And that's something that the market has done, Manishi, for last six quarters now. Uh, the obvious question is at some point, the market will stop giving benefit of doubt or should stop giving benefit of doubt from earnings point of view. What quarter would that be? Q3, Q4? At what point do the earnings need to catch up? You know, an honest answer is, you know, this, this question is possibly impossible to answer from a fundamental analyst's point of view. You know, when the market would actually give up hope on that earnings estimate revival. Um, I think, you know, um, it basically it would have to be, uh, you know, that time point when the valuations get too egregiously expensive. You know, so today we are possibly at about 16 times 12 month forward, 16 to 16.5, you know, bordering on 17 times, which is um, approximately about 8% higher than the long term average of about 15 to 15.2. If it gets much beyond this, you know, suppose it goes to a 20 to 25 percent premium, which would be close to about one to one and a half standard deviations higher than the long term average, then we really have something to worry. Um, so, you know, I've actually answered your question in a slightly different way. I haven't affixed a time point to the correction, but rather a valuation level, you know, which could turn out to be a cause for concern. I would also point out that there are certain global events that could lead to a correction in the markets as a whole, not just in India, but across emerging markets. Right now, we are wallowing in liquidity because, you know, the central banks keep on postponing their, um, you know, the rate hike targets and, um, you know, the, the time point at which they could really get a little more hawkish about shrinking the balance sheets and so on. But... You know, when that time point actually arrives, that is when we have to really be cautious about flows into emerging markets and therefore flows into India as well. In fact, India as a consequence of this valuation premium that it trades at could correct a little more than the emerging markets might. Okay. So for global risk, last time the markets actually rallied on the Fed rate hike. Why would it be different this time? You see, the difference between last time around and this time is possibly um, that on the previous, on many of the previous occasions, not all of them, but many of the previous occasions, it was significantly accelerating growth that was accompanied by a rate hike. You know, so um, the, mark, the central banks get cautious about inflation when growth accelerates. And therefore, you know, that actually translates into the kind of action that they take on the monetary policy front. This time around, yes, I mean, growth has turned slightly better than what it used to be. But there seems very little possibility of, for example, global GDP growth going back to the 3% level. It'll continue to hover in that 2 to 2.5% level for the time being. You know, so, um, you know, I think... You know, that is something that we have to be slightly cautious about, that, um, you know, if we do get a scenario of uh, sort of co coincident or uh, rate hikes in unison by the central banks, while at the same time the growth acceleration is not really too significant, then we could potentially have a problem on our hands. You know, so that's point number one. Secondly, I must also mention in this regard that... We, that is our own global economics team, have also turned a lot more dovish about their outlook about Fed rate hikes. Earlier, we believed that there would be, uh, you know, the next rate hike would be in December 2017, and there would be four rate hikes in 2018. But we have now revised that outlook to the next rate hike being in 2018 March, 
and there being just three rate hikes across the year, across 2018. So we are taking a significantly less hawkish view of what the Fed action could be going forward. And I think that's the kind of consensus that the market is settling down to, you know, which in turn has um, uh, in a sort of given rise to this outlook that this liquidity situation would remain stronger for longer. The kind of FIA flows that we're seeing in emerging markets would continue well into 2018. And that's, you know, the outcome of that is clearly this massive outperformance by emerging market equity. Okay, let's discuss some sectoral bets then, uh, Manishi. Uh, in the large sectors, uh, banks, IT, uh, maybe pharma, which ones would be your top overweight right now? Okay. First, uh, as far as the Indian market is concerned, we still remain overweight on India uh, in our Asian model portfolio, even though we have reduced the weight slightly. So earlier we had almost a 40% overweight compared to the benchmark. Today we have just about a 10 to 15% overweight. So that's point number one. We have also upgraded our, um, you know, the Sensex target by 2000, end of 2017. We earlier had a target of 30,300. Now the target stands at 32,500. We did this in early July. And even though that target was actually breached, you know, just about a day ago, but uh, we think that's some kind of a reasonable level for the time being. Coming back to your original question, you know, as far as the sectors go, we are overweight clearly on the consumption resilience. And there's not just in India, but across the Asian and emerging market universe, we think consumption resilience is likely to be a key theme that is already playing out and will continue to do so. So from that perspective, we are positive on the consumer discretionary side. Um, the auto names in particular select media companies as well. And uh, a few consumer staples, particularly those which are benefiting from increased product penetration. Yeah. So that's the first silo within India. The second or again, it's sort of related to this consumption theme. We still like the private sector banks, particularly those which are retail lenders and not so much corporate lenders. This is a stance that we have maintained for past one year. And even though we think that the government and the central bank's NPL reduction initiatives are likely to bear fruit, we are not yet you know, the dipping our toes in a big way in the PSU bank universe. The third silo are the potential industrial recovery beneficiaries. A few select few industrial companies which either benefit from a concentrated capex recovery in their sectors like transmission, power transmission and distribution, or the companies which have a very wide footprint across different areas and which have a relatively deleveraged portfolio. We have also included, um, you know, a select few, maybe just one stock in the oil refining and marketing universe, because they're the policy beneficiaries as a consequence of this whole, um, you know, the, the daily pricing of pe petroleum products. We think there are a few companies which tend to gain disproportionately. You know, so that is essentially our uh, preference universe across the Indian market. Um, you know, I think. You know, this is pretty much how investors should possibly look at the markets right now. All right, uh, Manishi, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us and giving us your sectoral uh, advice. Uh, we can get you more such advice. We heard some of the biggest market voices speak to CNBC TV 18 when the index touched 10,000. Here's what they have to say both about the levels in the market and where you can look for for value. Everyone feels that their own respective markets, even for global investors, are expensive and they're waiting on the sidelines for a correction to happen. So our view is that maybe a correction might happen because we are uh, definitely slightly above fair value. But those corrections are going to be short and swift, okay. uh, purely for the reason that there are more buyers on a fall rather than there are uh, sellers at a rise. We have been also getting investors to invest in closed-end uh, equity funds. So with this kind of an approach, uh, we believe that actually when the markets are high, these are safer ways to invest because these are not fully invested equity funds. These are funds where there's a fair amount of cash in the portfolios as seen even in the June portfolios. And we believe that kind of an approach is better to invest from going forward from here than to invest in fully invested funds.
but the company has managed to persuade investors to invest in balance. more conservative products. Okay. I think that's an achievement because I don't think that if I go back to the 2007 boom, bulk of the money at that point of time was coming in infrastructure funds, okay. which were easily a high beta funds at that point of time.